Tom McCluskey was the son of the son of the son of a shipbuilder with a lineage reaching back to the switch from sails to steam in the shipyards on Belfast Loch. Early on at Harland and Wolf, McCluskey had been an engineering apprentice. When he graduated to the drawing office, his chores included responding to requests from ship owners for plans, manuals, and other documents, most of which he filled as quickly as possible with the approval of the chief technical manager. There were also letters asking for information about Titanic, many of them poignantly written by relatives of the victims of the disaster. To these, McCluskey replied with a form letter that said, the company is unable to assist you in obtaining the information you have requested. At the end of one day in an endless succession of days at the shipyard, McCluskey asked his boss if he could devote some of his time to researching questions about Titanic and writing answers to all those letters. His boss told him that Harland and Wolf would just as soon forget the Titanic had ever existed. But if McCluskey wanted to spend a few hours a week on the letters, it was okay with him. McCluskey opened storeroom doors that had been shut for decades. He found stacks and boxes of files, ledgers, and correspondence, none of it organized by topic, chronology, or hull number. There were at least a million individual drawings and plans for hundreds of ships and thousands of photographs. He had always done his work at the shipyard as well as he possibly could, advancing upward through the ranks. But that was a job. Organizing the archive and answering letters about Titanic became a vocation. After Ballard and Michel found the wreck in 1985, the trickle of letters asking for information about Titanic increased to a torrent. From 1968 until 1986, Harland and Wolf had built only 40 ships. The episodic downturns the company had weathered for a century had become a death spiral. Shipyards in Asia were building the same ships for half the price. Harland and Wolf hadn't turned a profit in decades. It was no longer a privately held company, but a heavily subsidized public corporation propped up with massive loans. The British government wanted nothing more than to unload it, and in 1989 finally succeeded, selling it for pennies on the dollar to Norwegian shipping magnate Fred Olsen, who changed the name to Harland and Wolf Holdings. As Harland and Wolf staggered into the last decade of the 20th century, maintaining the archive became a low priority. Hoping to justify its existence, McCluskey turned his office into a small business, selling copies of the plans, memorabilia, and photographs. He launched a collaboration with local manufacturers to produce a line of merchandise evoking the golden age of ships and shipbuilding. The Harland and Wolf Maritime Collection featured bone china, crystal glasses, linens, and silverware in the patterns of the White Star Line. In 1994, McCluskey got a call from Los Angeles. We want to rebuild Titanic for a movie, the speaker said. His name was Peter Lamont, and he was a production designer working for producer-director James Cameron. We want you to help us. By then, McCluskey had gotten used to calls asking for advice and help with fantastic schemes. He was skeptical, but something in Lamont's voice signaled a higher grade of confidence than the crackpots and wannabes. McCluskey agreed to meet him in Belfast. Would tomorrow be convenient? Lamont asked. I can be on the first flight in the morning. The next day, Lamont made a deal with Harland and Wolf to borrow McCluskey as a technical advisor. The movie makers would pay his salary and expenses. The company would give him a leave of absence. Because of the eight-hour time difference between Belfast and the west coast of the United States, McCluskey worked at night from home, checking emailed scenes and photographs of sets for accuracy. McCluskey was celebrated by historical societies, movie makers, and shipping buffs. But his life inside Harland and Wolf deteriorated into a bitter conflict with its chief executive. For a while, McCluskey's resurrection of the archive did not rise high enough in the bureaucracy to attract attention from the top. Fred Olson, the new owner, had installed a seasoned industrial pro, Per Nielsen, to preside over the winding down of the shipyard and the emergence of Harland and Wolf Holdings as a real estate development company. Nielsen was infuriated by McCluskey 
reminding people that Harland and Wolf had built the notorious ship that killed hundreds of innocent men, women, and children was corporate suicide, not a point of pride. McCluskey's maritime collection was a bad idea, too, making a heavy industrial corporation look like an amateur museum. In the spring of 1997, McCluskey was promoting a gala to celebrate the Belfast screening of Cameron's Titanic. He wanted to set up tents and hold the after party on the site of the slipway where the ship had been built and invite people to come in period costumes to mingle with movie stars. Nielsen killed the party. It wouldn't make us any money, he told the newspaper reporter. It was a side issue to the main job of building ships and keeping the company going. Later that year, McCluskey and Nielsen got into a screaming fight. McCluskey had retrieved the builder's plate of the Canberra, Harland and Wolf's last great ocean liner, from the breaker's yard, a priceless artifact that McCluskey wanted to install in the shipyard as a monument. Nielsen ordered him to put it in storage. Two days later, after working late, McCluskey left his office, drove home, stretched out on the sofa with a bad headache, and had a stroke that left him paralyzed and blind in one eye. It took him three years to relearn how to speak, move his arms, and walk. For six months, Harland and Wolf paid him half his salary. After that, he got nothing. In 2000, at the age of 50, he asked for his job back. Not a chance, Nielsen told him. Take your pension, you're done. When McCluskey emerged from the International Arrivals Hall at Boston's Logan Airport, Roger Long's heart sank. The jockey-sized old man carrying a satchel was balding with a comb over and thick arched dark eyebrows and he walked with the hesitant gait of exhaustion. His skin tone was only a shade away from the white of his sport coat. Long was afraid that the man he was hoping would fill the hole in his theory was going to keel over before he ever had a chance to talk to him. A half hour later, after checking into their hotel near the airport, Long took McCluskey to dinner. The Italian restaurant was dark, aromatic, and packed with families and couples on dates. Long ordered a beer and chicken cacciatore. McCluskey ordered water and spaghetti. McCluskey would do an interview the next day in front of a camera, but Long couldn't wait. Tom, I want to hear what you have come to tell me, he said. You know what we think happened to the ship from our emails and the stuff I sent you. What we can't figure out is how it could have been so weak. Long's blunt question transformed McCluskey. The exhausted, timid man from the airport was replaced by a pedant who confidently explained himself. It's the stroke, he said. When I'm tired, people tell me I look like I'm drunk or very sick, but I get little bursts of energy. To begin with, McCluskey said in answer to Long's question, Thomas Andrews saw Olympics Hull panting during sea trials. Long knew exactly what that meant. The hull of a steel ship is in constant motion, flexing, bending, and even doing what Andrews had called panting, with the sides of the hull moving in and out. The motion is rarely visible to the unaided eye. It was a question of degree. How do you know, Long asked. I read Andrews's engineering notebooks for Olympic, McCluskey said. McCluskey had read everything. He talked about Andrews's adding steel to Titanic's superstructure, the cracks in the hulls of both ships, the dismal condition of the bow plates and rivets after Hawk collided with Olympic. Peary, Andrews, Ismay, Wilding, and everybody else at Harland and Wolf had had no idea whether Olympic and Titanic were strong enough to hold together at sea. They were cultural egomaniacs, McCluskey said, as if he were personally offended by all of them. They thought they could do anything they wanted to do build anything as big as they wanted it to be. As McCluskey had gotten to know Titanic, its builders, and its owners, he'd found himself unable to ignore the monumental hubris of the age. Inventors and builders had entered the 19th century using only their own and animal power, with little help from wind and water, the same things they had used for millennia. They had entered the 20th century with capacities for transportation, production, and manufacturing 
multiplied a thousandfold by the power of machines. It was regrettable, but completely understandable, if shipbuilders thought they could make ships as big as they wanted them to be. Peary, Andrews, and Wilding had simply scaled up the hull of oceanic and much smaller ships, doing their strength calculations with pencils. Long knew that engineering a hull was never a matter of merely putting more steel into it. The trick was to use just enough. It was easy to be wrong. In fact, it was a miracle if one was right. Titanic was nowhere near as strong a ship as it would have had to be for the high angle break theory to be true. Why are you talking to me about this now, Tom? Long asked. I'm tired of carrying it around in me, McCluskey said. After the stroke, every day might be my last. The next morning, Roger Long and a video crew were set up in Bill Lang's conference room at Woods Hole. McCluskey looked rested and relaxed. Chatterton was due sometime that morning. Kohler was at home with his children. Okay, Tom, Long began. Let's start with what you said Thomas Andrews observed during Olympics sea trials. What you told me at dinner last night. You don't design two sister ships. You design one, McCluskey said. Then you use the same set of plans to build both of them. On the Titanic drawings, over which I have spent many hours, you can see lots of changes made by Thomas Andrews after he discovered design flaws during Olympic sea trials, things that could have been done better or been done differently. McCluskey went into far more detail than he had over dinner the night before. After Andrews noticed that the hull was panting during Olympic sea trials, he worried that the hull wasn't stiff enough. White Star had scheduled Olympic to sail on its first crossing immediately so Andrews couldn't change anything right then. But he could and did add steel bracing to Titanic, particularly in the bow and the superstructure of the front of the ship. The most dramatic change he made to Titanic was enclosing the promenade deck with steel. White Star said it was to turn the promenade into a small restaurant, but that wasn't true. It was to stiffen the ship. There was a tremendous amount of vibration in that part of Olympic, so Andrews tried to stop it on Titanic. He also added reinforcing steel to Titanic at the bottom, where the double bottom met the main hull. Roger Long managed to stay in his chair, but he felt like doing cartwheels around the room. If Olympic had been panting and cracking in calm seas, it must have been right on the edge of coming apart. What about the possibility that the ship broke up on the surface and that it would have stayed afloat a lot longer if it had not, Long asked. At the inquiry, Harland and Wolfe did not offer any opinion about the ship breaking up on the surface, McCluskey said, his voice stronger and more assertive than ever. They avoided the question. However, from private documentation within the company, which I saw many times, they determined that it was very likely that the ship had broken in half. It was never made public. After Harland and Wolfe's confidential investigation determined that Titanic had probably broken up on the surface, McCluskey said, they had come to a horrible conclusion. Using estimates of the amount of water flooding into the ship through its damaged bow, they calculated that if Titanic had not broken, it would have remained afloat for three to three and a half hours. Plenty of time for half-empty lifeboats to return or for Carpathia to arrive. John Chatterton, who had arrived a few minutes earlier, tapped Long on the shoulder and whispered, Am I hearing what I think I'm hearing? McCluskey glanced at Chatterton, paused, and went on. No one at the inquiry asked the right questions, he said. Edward Wilding, who testified on behalf of Harland and Wolfe, had been instructed to volunteer nothing. One of the first disturbing pieces of evidence McCluskey had found in his exploration of the Harland and Wolfe archive was in the design notes. Andrews had specified one and a quarter inch plate for the Olympic class halls, but Ismay had told Andrews that the ship had to be built lighter than his original design. He had calculated that the hull needed to be one and a quarter inch steel to have an acceptable degree of strength. White Star had insisted that all they really needed under the Board of Trade rules was one inch steel, 
Harland and Wolf managers would have known that the lesser thickness of steel would have weakened the hull, but they did what the customer wanted them to do. If Andrews had built the ship he'd wanted to build, things probably would have turned out a lot differently. Roger, I have to ask you now, on the record with the cameras rolling, McCluskey said, sounding like an interrogator instead of an interview subject. Have you seen the internal memos and design notes which describe how Harland and Wolf thought Titanic broke up? Absolutely not, Long answered, obviously taken aback by the question out of the blue. Well, when I saw your analysis, I was sure that you had seen these memos. I was charged for years with keeping them secret, and that would have meant that I had failed. As far as I know, they have never been seen outside of Harland and Wolf. The scenario you reverse engineered was very, very, very close to what Harland and Wolf already knew in 1912. After Harland and Wolf's internal investigation, Perry and Ismay had decided on their own to retrofit Olympic with a double hull, build Britannic with a double hull, and redesign the expansion joints and other weak points in the ships. There was no law that required them to do that. Titanic had perfectly conformed to the regulations of the British Board of Trade. What about the Board of Trade inquiry, Long asked. It was a whitewash to reassure the world that British ships were safe, McCluskey said. Harland and Wolfe didn't want people to think their ships were substandard, which they certainly weren't, according to the law. But it would be easy for people to think that they were if Harland and Wolfe had revealed everything they knew. After McCluskey's confirmation of Long's theory about the sinking, and his allegation that Harland and Wolfe had covered up the probability that Titanic was a weak ship, Chatterton and Kohler could think about little else but returning to the wreck. A week after the Woods Hole revelations, their hopes were dashed when the Russian government recalled Keldish and the Mears, canceling all Titanic charters for the foreseeable future. Chatterton and Kohler had lost their return to Titanic, but they could still get to Britannic, which lay off the coast of Greece in 400 feet of water and reachable by scuba. If Perry and Ismay had pushed the envelope of strength too far when they'd built Olympic and Titanic, the changes they'd made to Britannic would reveal what they thought was wrong with the first two sisters. The night Titanic sank, the first of Britannic's frames was rising from its keel on the slipway at Harland and Wolfe. After two months of mourning and indecision, Perry and Ismay agreed to complete the hull but to wait to outfit the ship until there was a chance that passengers would have forgotten enough about Titanic to buy tickets on its sister. Britannic went into the River Logan with no fanfare in February 1914, after which it lay derelict at the dock for more than a year. When the war began, Perry finished it with money from the Admiralty. His Majesty's hospital ship Britannic left Belfast painted bright white with three giant red crosses on each side. At dawn on November 21, 1916, Britannic was steaming south of Athens on its way to pick up British wounded in Turkey when it struck a mine that had been laid across its path by a German submarine. The explosion blew a hole in the starboard side a hundred feet from the bow. Britannic's captain steered at full speed toward the island of Kea six miles away, reckoning that his best chance was beaching the ship. The decision to beach a crippled ship is instinctive to a seasoned mariner in sight of land but it was a mistake. Britannic flooded much more quickly as it plowed ahead than it would have had it stopped dead immediately. Thirty minutes after the mine exploded, the foredeck was underwater. Kea was still two and a half miles away. The captain ordered the lifeboat's launch to evacuate the 1,067 crew members and medical staff. Where Britannic stopped, the channel was only 400 feet deep, so the bow of the 882-foot liner hit the bottom while more than half of the ship was above the surface. Britannic's three gigantic propellers were still revolving, creating a vortex that sucked in the fleeing lifeboats as soon as they were lowered to the sea. The deadly situation was immediately obvious to the experienced sailors in command of the boats, who ordered the doctors, nurses, and orderlies to jump for their lives. <laughs> 
most obeyed and were able to paddle away from the crackling, thundering mass of the sinking ship. Thirty men and women died under the propellers when their boats were smashed to matchsticks. The Aegean in November is warm. Greek fishermen and passing warships rescued 1,037 men and women who had survived the ordeal of abandoning ship into the lifeboats and then abandoning their lifeboats for the open sea. Among the survivors was Violet Jessup, who had also survived the sinking of Titanic. Aboard the rescue ship Carpathia, she had complained about forgetting her toothbrush when she left the doomed ocean liner. Oh yes, another survivor had said sarcastically, never undertake a disaster without making sure of your toothbrush. When Jessup went into one of Britannic's 44 lifeboats and then into the sea, with parts of bodies mangled by the propellers floating around her, she had her toothbrush in the pocket of her smock. After the lifeboats were away, the weight of the water flooding Britannic drove its bow into the sea floor while half of its length remained above the surface. The ship corkscrewed to the right, and the hole in its starboard side opened wider. Less than an hour after it struck the mine, Britannic was on the bottom. Except for the crumpled bow, it looked like a ship that had lain down to sleep on the floor of the sea. Chatterton had already been to Britannic. In 1998, the wreck had almost killed him, when his rebreather quit inside the hull at 400 feet. The rebreather gave a diver more bottom time than ordinary scuba, but it depended on a computer and sensors to maintain the proper balance of oxygen in the air supply. Chatterton was in the fireman's tunnel leading to the boiler rooms, hoping to see if the watertight doors were open, which might have explained why Britannic sank so quickly. He shined his light on the LED that was supposed to tell him exactly what he was breathing. It was blank. Chatterton risked a couple more breaths, not knowing if too much oxygen or too much carbon dioxide would cripple him in an instant. He swam back to his emergency air tanks and survived. But he hated having gotten so close to the watertight doors and failed. Before Chatterton and Kohler left for Greece, Roger Long told them that what they found out about Britannic could confirm that Peary and Ismay had feared the Titanic was a weak ship. The two joints Andrews designed for Olympic and Titanic were disasters waiting to happen, he said. Peary had put three expansion joints into Britannic, but no one knew whether they were different from those on Titanic. If the expansion joints were different, it meant that not only had Peary and the other Harland and Wolfe engineers suspected that Titanic's hull plating was too light, but that they'd also been worried that Titanic had broken on the surface because the expansion joint under the third funnel was a critically weak point in the ship. Long wanted to see videotape of at least one of Britannic's expansion joints. Britannic had lain undisturbed until Jacques Cousteau found it. Cousteau was using new side-scan sonar to map the sea floor off the Attica Peninsula in southern Greece when he came across the wreck on December 3, 1975. It was unmistakable, an enormous steel mass in 400 feet of water eight miles from where the British Admiralty chart said it was. Cousteau's discovery set off a squall of controversy, resurrecting German allegations that the hospital ship Britannic had been carrying fresh troops and munitions to the Turkish front, which was why the German naval forces had mined the Kea Channel. The British, according to the darkest suspicions, had intentionally marked the incorrect location of the wreck on the chart so no one would find it and prove the German accusations were right. For Cousteau, the controversy was a gift. In the 20 years since he and Louis Mal had shot Le Monde du Silence, the silent world, winning a medal at Cannes and forever changing the mass audience appeal of documentary films, he had produced a steady stream of television shows which had made him famous. His success also drove him and the crew of Calypso to come up with dozens of new and interesting stories from beneath the sea every year. The wreck of Britannic was perfect. No one knew why the double-hulled ship had gone down so quickly. The Germans had accused the British of lying to the world. Best of all, 
Britannic was Titanic's sister ship. Cousteau and his divers descended in teams of three, breathing helium and oxygen mixed in oversized tanks that gave them 15 minutes of bottom time. They ascended in stages to 130 feet, where they entered a submersible decompression chamber. The chamber was then hoisted aboard Calypso for the remaining decompression time. After inspecting Britannic's holds and accommodation spaces, Cousteau declared that it had carried no troops or munitions. It had only been what the British said it had, a hospital ship on its way to pick up wounded from the Battle of Gallipoli. Cousteau said the catastrophic damage to its bow was not the result of the detonation of hidden munitions, as the Germans had alleged. It had probably come from coal dust explosions. Chatterton and Kohler had never organized anything on the scale of the expedition to Greece. Their trip to Titanic had been more expensive, but exploring Britannic would be infinitely more complex and dangerous. Very few people in the world are capable of diving to 400 feet, spending enough time on the bottom for meaningful investigation of a shipwreck, and enduring five hours of decompression on the ascent. They put together a team of 15, all of them friends, and every one of them in the top tier of any ranking of technical shipwreck divers. They also hired two men who knew the corridors and compartments of Britannic as well as the streets and alleys of their own neighborhoods. Englishman Simon Mills actually owned the wreck. He'd bought its salvage rights a decade earlier. Mills had written the definitive book on Britannic and had been on the Titanic expedition with Chatterton and Kohler. Parks Stevenson, a systems engineer from California and a lifelong student of the Olympic-class ships, had created an interactive computer simulation of Britannic's bow section. Chatterton and Kohler had three veteran divers to tend the decompression station and provide shallow support. Bill Lang and his assistant Marianne Moran Keith bought their cameras. Kirk Wolfinger was there with his cameras. Petard de Noble, from the Divers Alert Network, was the expedition doctor. Titanic veteran Bob Blumberg, from the State Department, came along to help with diplomatic problems, of which there were likely to be a few. Although Mills owned Britannic, both the British and the Greek governments had final say over who could dive to the wreck and what they could do when they got there. Every expedition after Cousteau's had been mired in bureaucratic muck. Chatterton and Kohler decided to use their first dive to find out whether Britannic's watertight doors were open or closed. This would be as difficult as going into the wreck to search for an expansion joint. But there was one advantage to making it their first dive. Chatterton had already been in the fireman's tunnel. They previewed their dive using Stevenson's computer model of Britannic's interior and Mills's drawings of the ship. Their plan was to descend to the wreck on the shot line, enter the hull, swim about 70 feet through the fireman's tunnel, go around the boilers in boiler room six, see the watertight doors, and take the pictures. Both Chatterton and Kohler had been to 400 feet before, but not many times, and they had never stayed at that depth as long as they would on Britannic. Andrea Doria, long the standard of qualification for an elite wreck diver, was at 250 feet. U869 was at 230. Going to 400 and staying there for 40 minutes would be the most difficult dive Chatterton and Kohler had ever attempted together. Venturing inside the hull on their first descent was very close to foolhardy. Usually, a first dive on a deep wreck is extremely conservative, a chance to get used to the depth and the darkness and find one's bearings on the wreck. Without the detailed briefings on the inside of the ship Stevenson and Mills had given them, and the fact that Chatterton had already been to the wreck, they would not have risked penetration on their first dive. They used rebreathers for the return to Britannic. After a decade of evolution, these devices were far more reliable than the one that almost killed Chatterton, offering enormous advantages over ordinary scuba. With mixed gas in a conventional tank, bottom time at 400 feet was 10 or 12 minutes. With a rebreather, divers could spend 40 minutes on the wreck and decompress for five hours without any support from the surface unless there was an emergency. At 45 minutes to splash, Chatterton and Kohler slipped into thin polypropylene diving underwear. 
which was enough insulation for a dive into the relatively warm Aegean Sea. Cotton was no good. They sweated while they were on the surface, and cotton wouldn't wick away the moisture. In the water, the drying sweat would chill them, which was another way to get the bends. Over the underwear, Chatterton and Kohler put on their dry suits. In five minutes, they were sweating as if they'd run a mile on a hot day. They strapped on two razor-sharp sheath knives, one on each thigh, with an easy reach. Into the pockets of their dry suits, they put two marker buoys and reels of line for sending emergency signals to the surface. The sea was calm, so the footing on Apollon's deck was good when they bent over to put on their fins. Finally, they backed up to a bench to slip into their rebreathers and rested for a few minutes. Chatterton poured a bucket of seawater over Kohler's head to cool him down. Kohler returned the favor. They switched on their rebreathers. Kohler didn't get throw-up scared anymore. When he was 20 years younger and other divers were dying on the Doria, he would get so sick he felt like he was going to vomit into his mouthpiece. By the time he'd prepared himself for descending to Britannic, the fear was different. He never believed he was going to die. It was more like the fear he got on an amusement park roller coaster. Chatterton had polished his fear into a little nut that he tucked away like a piece of gear in the pocket of his dry suit. When something went wrong, he knew there was a certain pucker factor, but he had made a lot of dives where everything didn't go the way it was supposed to go. He knew that if he had only made dives when nothing had gone wrong, he would only know how to dive if nothing went wrong. Chatterton had been on dives when he'd lost his air, dives when a guy he was with had died, dives when his computer or his rebreather had quit. He knew how to fix problems. The key was not to overreact. To Chatterton, fear was a healthy emotion, but panic didn't do him any good at all. Since he had failed in his attempt to reach the watertight doors in 1998, Chatterton had been thinking about the fireman's tunnel. Sitting on the bench on Apollon, he thought of Carl Spencer, one of the other divers who had been to the tunnel but had not made it to the doors either. While Spencer was briefing Chatterton, he had thrown his animated English lad's face into a mask of horror. There are monsters down there, John, he'd said. Then his face had snapped back into a normal expression as he said, I'm not kidding. The eight-foot drop from Apollon's rail into the sublimely cool water ended the sweltering torment on the surface and relieved them of the staggering weight of a hundred pounds of equipment. Chatterton splashed first. Bill Lang's crew handed him the video camera. Then Kohler was in the water with him. They made eye contact, checked for obvious leaks in their rebreather loops and air bottles, swam to the shot line and descended into the embrace of the Aegean Sea. At 160 feet, they passed a school of hundreds of fish, three to four feet long, 30 or 40 pounds each. They were there for a moment, silver against the blue background, then gone in a blink. At 200 feet, the wreck began to emerge in the dim blue glare below them, a gigantic dark mass that extended into invisibility. A minute later, they were at 300 feet, at the end of the shot line chained to a davit on Britannic's deck. Visibility was about 100 feet. Chatterton and Kohler spent a minute of their precious bottom time orienting themselves. They were on the rail of the ship's port side and could clearly see the bottom 90 feet below. Britannic lay on its starboard side, its hull draped with snagged fishing nets, covered with sponges, oysters, barnacles, and a brownish algae. In the fishing net closest to them, they could see a half dozen eight or ten pound lobsters tangled in the web. The entrance to the fireman's tunnel was a four by eight foot rectangle at the center line of the ship, 45 feet below them. They descended, reached the entrance, and saw that it was covered by a fishing net. Kohler ducked underneath the net, finding plenty of room between it and the hull. As soon as one of them kicked into the tight space, visibility behind him would drop to zero. Chatterton and the camera went first, with Kohler swimming blindly behind him. Instantly, the diffuse blue light from above was gone. They adjusted their buoyancy to be slightly negative so they could hold themselves up from the wall of the tunnel below them and finger walk in.
there was a metal grate on their right. The steel wall above them dripped with the hard spikes of rusticles and tangled wires, which scraped the hard plastic shells of their rebreathers as they moved. After 70 feet of crawling in the tunnel, they broke out into the boiler room, a cavern 45 feet up and 45 feet down, with the four boilers, each 15 feet in diameter, straight ahead of them. It looked exactly like the pictures they had seen of the same boiler room on Titanic. Every wreck dive produces a single indelible moment, and on Britannic, that was it. Neither of them had ever been in so large an enclosed space underwater. They had to get past the boilers to see the room's watertight door. Kohler stayed put while Chatterton descended 30 feet and disappeared into the space between the bottom two boilers. Kohler hung strobe lights at the opening into the fireman's tunnel to mark the way out, ascended to the gap between the third and fourth boilers 30 feet above, and shined his flashlight beam between the boilers. The light coming out on the other side would guide Chatterton to his exit point. By entering low and coming out high, Chatterton wouldn't have to swim through the sediment he kicked up on his way in, and he would have a well-lit course to follow in case he got disoriented. Holding the camera in front of him, Chatterton was scraping his belly and the top of his rebreather on the boilers. Twenty feet in, the beam of his light flattened against something dead ahead of him. A piece of metal. No, it was a wheelbarrow wedged between the boilers. Chatterton swam to it, surrounded by a cloud of silt that had caught up with him when he'd stopped. With one hand, he held the camera to the side. With the other, he pushed on the wheelbarrow. It was wedged tight. The silt around it was like concrete. I got a problem here, Richie. Over. Go. Over. Obstruction. Viz going to shit. Over. Chatterton said, his voice coming in staccato bursts. Kohler recognized the danger signal. That's three problems, Kohler thought. He's blocked from going ahead. He can't see anything. He's huffing and puffing. One problem, maybe we keep trying. Three, no way. Abort, 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 Kohler barked. Roger, abort, Chatterton said. Back on the surface, things had turned as sour as they had in the boiler room on Britannic. The bureaucrat from the Greek Department of Antiquities, assigned to the expedition as an observer, was furious. During the dive to the boiler room, Bill Lang had lowered a remote-controlled camera to Britannic. As Apollone drifted away from the wreck, the camera panned over the bottom for a few hundred feet before Lang pulled it up. The guy from Antiquities claimed Lang had lowered the camera to search for other wrecks and debris, a violation of their permit, which limited exploration to only Britannic. He said they were also violating their permit by going inside the wreck. Chatterton and Kohler knew that they had specifically asked for permission to enter Britannic's hull, been told that the permit was in order, and figured somebody was trying to shake them down for more money. They would ignore the bureaucrat and dive to find the expansion joint the next day. An hour after making their decision, Chatterton was retching into the sink in his hotel room. He had a fever burning behind his eyeballs and couldn't stop shaking. He managed to drag himself out of the bathroom long enough to call Kohler, who arrived five minutes later with the expedition doctor. Chatterton probably had food poisoning, or maybe a bug from the water. With rest and hydration, he would be better in 48 hours, but he was unfit to dive the next day. I'll go alone, Kohler said. I know you can do it, Richie, Chatterton said but you've got to have somebody running the camera. Roger has to see what you see. A 100-foot penetration of a shipwreck was dicey under the best of circumstances. This one would be the most difficult dive Kohler had ever made. It was one thing for him to do it. It was another thing to ask one of the other divers to go with him. Every one of them would say yes, but Chatterton and Kohler didn't want to put the obligation on any of them. What about Barney? Chatterton asked. You guys have spent a lot of time on wrecks together. Mike Barnett, Barney, was a marine biologist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in St. Petersburg, Florida. Kohler compared Chatterton to a partner he danced with in serious competitions, and Barney to a partner with whom he danced for fun. Barney knew all the moves, 
and he knew Kohler's moves too. They had been on wrecks at 300 feet, never had a problem, always seemed wordlessly in sync underwater. Kohler knew that Barney had been to 400 feet enough times to feel comfortable at that depth. He was a master rebreather diver. Probably the man, Kohler said. It sucks that we won't do this together, John. No choice, Richie. Unless I'm completely misreading this shit with the Greeks, they're going to shut us down. One more dive is probably all we're going to get. It frosts my ass that we won't get another shot at the boiler room, but the expansion joint is what we came for. The next morning, two policemen in an SUV were parked on the dock watching the divers load gear, water, food, and cameras. When Apollone backed into the channel, it felt like a jailbreak. Barnett had a different style in the water than Chatterton. He moved a little slower, more deliberately. On the descent, he filmed Kohler from above until at 250 feet, Barnett swam down to the wreck and filmed him from below. All business. Kohler felt confident when he splashed with Barnett, and even better after they tuned into each other's rhythms on the drop to the wreck. Behind them, Mike Fowler and Mike Pizio descended to inspect the outside of the hull for evidence of the expansion joint, while Kohler and Barnett were inside. When Kohler got to what he thought was B-deck, something was very wrong. Stevenson and Mills had said if he saw a door at the entrance to the promenade, he was on the wrong deck. Kohler was sure he was where he was supposed to be. He had counted the decks during his descent, and the promenade looked exactly like the one in the plans of the ship he had studied for weeks. It had been used as an officer's ward, a comfortable, well-ventilated corridor that must have been the best place on the ship on a hot day. There were windows where there were supposed to be windows. Only the door shouldn't have been where it was. Kohler decided to bet that Stevenson, Mills, and the plans were wrong. At some point between drawing the ship and building it, a doorway had been added to the promenade on B-deck. Kohler kicked and entered the wreck. The light was pretty good inside. The windows above him that weren't broken were covered with algae and anemones, transforming the blue of the abyss into a stained glass effect. Church light, Kohler thought. Below him, through doorways and windows in the interior wall, he peered into staterooms. The wooden walls had rotted away, revealing plumbing and the bright white ceramics of sinks and bathtubs. He saw piles of wooden wheelchairs half eaten by worms, the metal frames and springs of hospital beds, open cabinets glimmering with bottles and glasses. If Kohler hadn't had a job to do, he would not have been able to resist going farther into the middle of the ship. Kohler counted windows, moving from the bow to the stern. One window equaled 10 feet. The expansion joint was supposed to be 100 feet in. Kohler swam carefully, alert to the possibility that wreckage beyond the beam of his lights could block the way at any point. At seven windows, his clock showed 18 minutes elapsed. Something's got to happen pretty quick, he thought. The expansion joint was supposed to be covered by a brass plate on the floor of the promenade, which was to Kohler's right. 19 minutes. Kohler thought he saw something bright wink at him. He reached out and drew his hand through the coating of fine silt and algae. Nothing. He was right at the ninth window. Maybe they were wrong about that too. He glanced over his shoulder, careful to not look directly at the camera lights. There was Barnett calm, perfectly neutral, hovering slightly above him. The tenth window. Nothing. Kohler and Barnett reversed course. Kohler pushed his face to within six inches of the deck. Nothing. Back to the ninth window. Kohler was turning to shake his head at Barnett when he saw it. A definite gap in the steel covered by a plate of a different kind of metal, shinier. It wasn't in the floor of B-deck, it was in the ceiling and walls. But no doubt about it, the expansion joint. About 14 inches wide, like a door threshold. Kohler backed away to make room for the camera. Barnett shot the joint along its full length from every possible angle. He videotaped the place where the joint was supposed to be, but wasn't. They were 25 minutes into the dive. It was going to take eight minutes to swim out of the ship, 
that left five minutes for sightseeing. The likelihood that either of them was ever going to dive on Britannic again was remote. Before they splashed, they had agreed that if they had any time on the clock after getting the job done, they would reward themselves with a swim through the navigation bridge. When they came out of the promenade, the wing of the bridge the officers used for docking was directly over their heads and to the right. Kohler looked at Barnett and made the hand signal for a steering wheel. Barnett nodded. The bridge of Britannic was identical to Titanic's. Kohler saw the engine room telegraph, its commands clearly visible, full ahead, stop, astern. When Kohler reached out and touched it, his imagination put him not on an ill-fated hospital ship, but on the bridge of Titanic. It was the sweetest moment in his life as a wreck diver. He imagined Captain Smith, Murdoch, Lighttoller, and Andrews on the bridge the reprehensible Ismay. He saw the patient sailor on the helm responding to commands by echoing the commands for course changes. He looked to his left, toward the bow, shined his light through shards of broken glass, and saw the surface of the open ocean stretching out ahead of him, blue and endless. Kohler's delight at correcting the experts about the layout of the promenade finding the cover of the expansion joint, and hearing Fowler and Pizio's report that the joint ended in a thermometer-like bulb was short-lived. At the entrance to Kea's Harbor, a police boat, its blue lights flashing, burbled up to Apollon to escort it to the dock. Chatterton had recovered enough to meet them there with the news that the cops wanted all of the videotapes. The Department of Antiquities guy had accused them of breaking the law by going inside the wreck. Chatterton informed the two policemen squared off in front of him that he wasn't surrendering the tapes unless they told him in writing when he was going to get them back. As Kohler joined Chatterton on the dock, the policemen flipped open their holsters. You will now come with us to the police station. They sat on a bench in a sweaty little office while one of the policemen stood guard. Chatterton held up his cell phone. The guard nodded okay. Chatterton called one of the camera techs aboard Apollon and told him to start making copies of everything. An hour passed. Chatterton called Bob Blumberg, who said he was making inquiries, but wasn't optimistic. He said he'd never run into such a non-responsive group of people in an international situation. Nobody was taking his phone calls. Chatterton's phone rang. The camera tech had gotten everything duped. The police had just boarded up alone with their guns drawn and taken the originals. Ten minutes later, two cops marched into the office with a plastic bag and vanished into a back room. One of the cops came back with a piece of paper in his hand. We have ten tapes. You write us a receipt for those tapes and you can leave. I didn't give you those tapes, Chatterton said. I'm not signing something that says I did. I have no idea what's on those tapes. I don't know where you got them. I don't even know if they're ours. If we sign your paper, it's as good as a confession, Kohler said. No fucking way. Let's get out of here. I forbid you to leave, the policeman said. I'll tell you what, Chatterton said. We're going to stand up and walk out the door. If you want to shoot us in the back, shoot us in the back. It was one in the morning in Maine. The phone call from Chatterton and Kohler woke Roger Long from deep sleep, but it was the best middle-of-the-night call he had ever gotten. They were talking on speakerphone, finishing each other's sentences like an old married couple. Kohler had seen one of the expansion joints on Britannic. It was wider, with a metal cover and a round bulb rather than a V-notch where it met the hull. Definitely different than Olympic and Titanic's. The cops had taken the originals of the video, but they were pretty sure they had dupes. They were going to try to get out of Greece the next day. Proof that the expansion joints on Britannic were different than those on Titanic meant that Piri and Ismay had suspected that they were weak points. A lot of things can cause a hull to fail, Long said. They'd obviously thought Titanic's hull plating was too light because they'd added thousands of tons of steel to Olympic and Britannic by doubling their hulls. The quality of the rivets and steel when Titanic was built was nowhere near what it is today.
every porthole was a weak point from which cracks could propagate. Every flaw in Titanic's hull had stolen minutes from the lives of 1,504 people. Perry and Ismay must have been terrified when they'd figured that out. A public discussion of the weaknesses in their ship of dreams would have ruined them. They'd had no choice but to keep them secret. The wound in Peary's groin no longer smelled foul, but he was still emaciated and able to stand for only a few minutes each day. Over the strenuous objections of his wife, he willed himself to work. Peary was heart sore over the loss of Thomas Andrews and the ship he had lived his entire life to build, but he would not allow his emotions or his health to divert his attention from his life's most perilous moment. Perry instinctively knew that something had been dreadfully wrong with Titanic. Republic had stayed afloat for a day and a half after being opened up amidships from rail to waterline. The damage was not much different from that sustained by Titanic, but everyone on Republic who hadn't been killed in the collision had been saved. Olympic had taken a blow from HMS Hawk that would have sunk most ships, but it had made it back to Southampton on its own power. From London, Peary ordered work on Britannic stopped immediately. He told Edward Wilding to mathematically recreate every possible flooding scenario in which the ship sinks two hours and 20 minutes after its hull is breached. Wilding, who was in line to replace Andrews as Harland and Wolfe's chief designer, would use his conclusions to represent the company at the British Wreck Commission hearings in London. An admiralty judge and old friend of Peary's John Charles Bigham, Baron Mersey of Toxteth, was appointed to preside over the commission. Mersey would be assisted by one of the nation's leading naval architects, a distinguished engineer, two Navy officers, and a veteran solicitor general. They would take testimony from Titanic's builder, owner, and survivors to answer 26 questions drawn up by the British Board of Trade. The questions addressed the seaworthiness of the ship, the voyage, the extent of the damage, and the conduct of the crew and passengers. The British inquiry would begin on May 2nd, but Mersey gave Holland and Wolfe more time to prepare its testimony. Wilding would not testify until the end of the month. After receiving Peary's instructions, Wilding scrambled to calculate the amount of damage that could explain why Titanic sank so fast. Ismay had sent reports from America saying that the ship had struck the iceberg below the waterline at the bow. Wilding asked himself how much water it would have taken to sink the ship in just two hours and 20 minutes, then worked backward to figure out the size of the opening in the hull that could have admitted that much water. He calculated the weight of the water and the angle at which the ship would have begun to come apart. There was a very good chance the Titanic had broken up on the surface. When Peary learned about Wilding's conclusion that Titanic might very well have broken up on the surface, he told the engineer that his first responsibility was to protect the reputation of the company. Peary and Harland and Wolfe's own lawyers told Wilding that he was to answer questions narrowly, volunteering nothing. Peary knew that Mersey and his inquiry wanted the same outcome he did and would not press for answers they did not want to hear there must be no doubt that Harland and Wolfe's ships were strong and that Titanic had simply been the victim of a tragic accident. It was just good business for all concerned to preserve the reputation of the British Empire's greatest shipyard. Peary began planning for strengthening the hulls of Olympic and Britannic immediately. Olympic would be fitted with a double hull by fastening steel plates to its interior, to do that, they would have to sacrifice space inside the ship, which would require changes in the accommodations and reconfiguration of the machinery compartments. If construction began again on Britannic, they would widen the entire ship by 18 inches rather than sacrificing space on the inside. The watertight bulkheads, which did not extend to the top of the hull on Titanic, would go all the way up on Britannic. Olympic would be examined for cracking, especially around the expansion joints, and redesigned or reinforced to stop it. Two days before Wilding testified in London, Senator William Alden Smith released the conclusions of the American inquiry. 
it was good news for Harland and Wolf. The committee had heard from 82 witnesses, produced 1,100 pages of testimony, and blamed only Captain E.J. Smith for running at nearly full speed through a known ice field. The Americans exonerated Bruce Ismay, the White Star Line, all other officers and crew of Titanic, and Harland and Wolf. The committee concluded that the ship had sunk in one piece and had met or exceeded all standards governing the construction, equipment, and operation of a British passenger liner. Negligence by its owners or builders, therefore, was not an issue in American insurance claims. Lord Mersey and the five members of the Wreck Commission sat at desks on a dais at the front of the drill hall of the Scottish Regiment near Buckingham Palace. To the commissioner's right were a 40-foot-long drawing of Titanic, a 20-foot-long half-model of the ship, and a 15-by-15-foot chart of the North Atlantic showing Titanic's course. The ceiling of the cavernous hall was 50 feet high. The acoustics were terrible. The Board of Trade's chief counsel, Sir Rufus Isaacs, read the order for formal investigation. He summarized the 26 questions the board wanted the Wreck Commission to answer. Questions 1 through 8 related to what happened before the accident and before there was any suggestion that the ship was sailing into an ice field. Questions 9 through 14 asked about what happened after the captain was warned about the ice. Question 15 by far the broadest, concerned the accident itself. Questions 16 through 24 inquired as to the steps taken after the accident to save lives and save the ship. Question 25 related to the construction and equipment of Titanic. Question 26 asked the Commission to evaluate current shipping regulations and suggest changes. The next day, the Solicitor General asked the first of what would become 25,621 carefully numbered questions. Is your name Archie Jewell? Jewell, a lookout who had gotten off his watch in the crow's nest an hour and 40 minutes before Titanic hit the iceberg, said that was his name. He answered 329 more questions about the routines of sailors aboard Titanic using the huge chart of the ship to show his duty station and his quarters. Following Archie Jewell, 96 witnesses told their stories. Lightoller calmly answered 1,600 questions, fencing with his inquisitors as he had with Senator Smith in America. None of Titanic's officers, he said, did anything in the navigation and evacuation of the ship that could be subject to criticism. Fireman George Beecham said he was in Boiler Room 6 at impact and that he continued working for at least 15 minutes before being ordered to evacuate. This conflicted with Fireman Fred Barrett's testimony that Boiler Room 6 was so catastrophically damaged on impact that the water immediately drove him to flee from Boiler Room 6. Barrett also said that Boiler Room 5 was taking water when he arrived. The inconsistency meant that the ship might not have been damaged as far back as Boiler Room 5, and that Barrett was either lying or mistaken about his location when he saw water burst through the hull. Mersey did not examine the inconsistency. Every utterance of a witness or inquisitor made news around the world, but none was more sensational than the testimony of Sir Cosmo and Lady Duff Gordon. They had fled the ship in one of the first lifeboats, with only ten other passengers. There was no question that Lady Duff Gordon had a right to be in the boat. Cosmo Duff Gordon, who was a regular item in the endless stream of gossip that rolled around Europe, convinced the wreck commission that his leaving Titanic while there were still women and children aboard was perfectly legitimate. No one else wanted to go. Ismay answered 849 questions. He denied any involvement in the navigation of the ship, he denied getting into the lifeboat while there were any other passengers, men, women, or children, nearby. He denied any participation in drawing up the specifications for the ship, including the number of lifeboats it would carry. Harold Sanderson followed Ismay, testifying for the better part of two days. The thrust of his testimony, guided by several inquisitors, 
was that the White Star Line equaled or exceeded the rules of the Board of Trade relating to construction of their ships and lifeboat capacity. Alexander Montgomery Carlyle, Perry's brother-in-law and a former Harland and Wolf director, showed up looking dazed and exhausted. He testified that he had argued for more lifeboats. His original specifications for Titanic had called for 48. He knew that rules required only 16 lifeboats on all ships over 10,000 tons. But Titanic was five times bigger. His original specifications for lifeboats, with which Thomas Andrews concurred, had been overruled by Ismay. Isaacs tried to discredit Carlyle by pointing out that Carlyle had been a member of the board's committee that made the rules for lifeboats. Carlyle had signed the committee's recommendations in 1911, which required not more but fewer lifeboats. The Board of Trade and everyone else in the world believed that ocean liners had become virtually unsinkable. Carlyle, gray-bearded and haggard, shook visibly as he stood at the witness lectern. I regret having signed a report with which I did not concur, he said, sounding as though he were about to begin sobbing. I must have been soft. Edward Wilding answered 1,113 questions on three consecutive days, from eight different commissioners and lawyers. In painstaking detail, referring to the builder's model and the profile of the ship, Wilding spoke for hours about the construction of Titanic, the dimensions of its steel, watertight compartments, deck gear, rigging, engines, and lifeboats. He told the commission that he had calculated that the iceberg had made holes in the ship totaling 12 square feet, between the bow and boiler room 5, possibly as far aft as boiler room 4. Titanic had remained afloat for a long time, considering that catastrophic amount of damage. Wilding said he was sure the ship had gone down in one piece. A week later, at the request of a lawyer representing a seamen's union, Wilding was recalled to the witness podium. The lawyer asked how Wilding had calculated the strength of the ship to ensure that it could survive the worst sea conditions it might encounter on the North Atlantic. A big ship, the lawyer reasoned, had to span more waves than a small ship, which would place far greater loads on the hull. He read a letter from the Board of Trade, written in November 1910, asking Wilding to submit detailed calculations of the strength of the ship. Wilding had replied that reproducing those calculations would take three months and asked the board not to press for that information. And in fact, they did not press for it? The union's lawyer asked. They did not, Wilding replied. One of White Star's lawyers jumped to his feet and asked permission to address the witness. Is there any foundation at all for saying that you defied the Board of Trade? I really know of none, Wilding said. Or that the ship was allowed to be built by the officials of the Board of Trade in violation of their rules, the White Star lawyer asked. We have to comply with all their rules, and we make some sacrifices to do so, Wilding replied. The day after Wilding finished testifying, he wrote to Peary to say that he was going back to Belfast himself the next day, unless Peary ordered him to stay in London. The last paragraph of Wilding's one-page letter was an account of him fending off the barrage of questions about strength calculations from the Siemens Union lawyer, after which Mersey had not pursued the subject. Their secrets were safe. Peary knew about Wilding's testimony before he received the letter. He had stayed away from the drill hall but received daily reports as the hearings ground on into July. Peary had decided that Wilding was finished at Harland and Wolfe. He had avoided the big questions, but he had talked way too much. Ultimately, the British Wreck Commission agreed with the Americans. Titanic sank because its captain chose to speed through a field of ice about which he had been warned. The iceberg Titanic struck ripped a 300-foot-long gash in the starboard side, flooding five watertight compartments. The ship did not break in two. As the bow sank, its stern rose out of the water to a 50 or 60 degree angle before making its final plunge. Mersey's report specifically stated that Titanic had been constructed by Harland and Wolfe in accordance with Board of Trade rules.
The biggest ship Perry had ever built had taken 1,504 people to their deaths. His shipyard was still alive. When Bruce Ismay arrived in Liverpool aboard Adriatic at the end of April 1912, a small crowd on the dock broke into applause as he descended the gangway. Six months later, Morgan and his directors forced Ismay out as president of International Mercantile Marine. At the same time, he resigned as chairman of the White Star Line. Ismay remained as a director of both IMM and White Star until 1916, when he severed all connections with the Combine and his family company. He continued to work as an advisor to British insurance companies and was active in maritime charities. He donated money to build the cadet training ship Mersey and gave 11,000 pounds to a fund for widows of lost seamen. Ismay divided his time between London and Ireland, where he had a fishing lodge and was known among his guides as a good companion. He died after suffering a stroke on October 17, 1937, leaving an estate worth 693,305 pounds, approximately the equivalent of $52 million today. The White Star Line settled $16 million in claims arising from the Titanic disaster for $664,000. The next year was the most profitable in its history. In 1913, 2.5 million passengers crossed the Atlantic between Europe and the United States, setting a record that has never been broken. White Star carried 200,000 of them. Cunard, about the same number. In 1927, White Star was bought by the Royal Mail Group, which soon defaulted on its admiralty loans, leaving Great Britain as its majority stockholder. In 1934, the government merged White Star and Cunard in return for financing the 80,000-ton, 965-foot Queen Mary. Britannic III, the last ship to carry the crimson and white burgee of the White Star Line, was taken out of service in 1960. RMS Olympic, refitted with a double hull, became known as Old Reliable. On the night of May 15, 1934, it rammed and sank the Nantucket lightship off Cape Cod, killing seven of its 11 crewmen. After picking up survivors, Olympic steamed into New York under its own power. A year later, it was sold for scrap. In March 1913, J.P. Morgan died in the royal suite of the Grand Hotel in Rome. At the end, he was suffering from hypertension, dementia, and the pain of having had all his teeth pulled and replaced by dentures. After a decade of bank panics and stock market crashes, Americans had realized that giant private trusts were not the way to manage the wealth of the nation. Morgan had been living in Cairo and Rome because lawyers, congressional committees, and the press made life at home miserable for him. His body was shipped back to New York City aboard the SS France and taken by train to Hartford, Connecticut, where he had been born for burial. Even after Titanic, Morgan believed that international mercantile marine would prosper. He was certain America's future depended upon its presence in international markets. A year after his death, IMM defaulted on its bonds and went into bankruptcy. The Wall Street Journal concluded, The ocean was too big for the old man. The shipping boom during World War I saved IMM, after which it sold off its European holdings and reorganized as the United States Lines. It went bankrupt again in 1937, reorganized as a holding company, and disappeared for good in 1986. William Peary built 200 ships after finishing Britannic, the largest of them only two-thirds the size of the Olympic sisters. He recovered fully from his prostate surgery to lead Harland and Wolfe through the wartime boom. The company set records for profits every year in the following decade. He continued to expand, enlarging the Belfast shipyard and buying three others in Scotland and England. He invested heavily in oil exploration and production and built a new factory to manufacture diesel engines. Peary died of pneumonia aboard a ship he had built, RMS Ebro, in the Panama Canal on June 7, 1924. Twelve days later, 
his body was put aboard Olympic in New York for the voyage home to Belfast, where he was buried with a state funeral. The inscription on his coffin read, William James, 1st Viscount Peary, K.P., born Quebec 31st, May 1847, died at sea. Deeds, not words. After Peary's death, the Harland and Wolf Board of Directors appointed Margaret Peary as president of the company. She erected a monument over her husband's grave. On it were two bronze panels, one depicting Venetian, the first steamship he built, the other, Olympic. Margaret Peary died at home in London on June 19, 1935. She was buried next to Peary under his monument in Belfast City Cemetery. John Chatterton and Richie Kohler had begun their investigation into Titanic, hoping to discover evidence that might explain how the iceberg had damaged the ship so badly that it could not survive. Like millions of other people, they believed that Titanic had been a heroic ship, a testament to the power of the industrial age that had been undone by bad luck. Roger Long's low-angle breakup, Tom McCluskey's revelation of the cover-up by Harland and Wolfe, and what Chatterton and Kohler found on Britannic proved that Titanic had not been a heroic ship. It had been a deeply flawed testament to hubris and greed that killed 1,504 people. Chatterton and Kohler were infuriated because there was no way to punish the men who had sent a ship to sea, not knowing if it was strong enough to survive. Until they decided to tell the world what really happened to Titanic. This has been a Hachette audio production of Titanic's Last Secrets. Written by Brad Matson. Read by Henry Leva. Directed by Graham Malcolm. Produced by Michelle McGonigal. Post production by CDM Sound Studios. Titanic's Last Secrets is also available in print from Grand Central Publishing, a division of Hachette Book Group USA. Text copyright 2008 by Titanic Partners, LLC, and Brad Matson. Audio production copyright and published 2008 by Hachette Audio, all rights reserved. Except as permitted under the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976, no part of this production may be reproduced distributed or transmitted in any form or by any means, or stored in a database or retrieval system without the prior written permission of the publisher.